Uh, this afternoon, we are going to finish uh, reading H.G. Wells' uh, novel, The First Man in the Moon. Uh, uh, as you know, H.G. Uh, Wells uh, is regarded as the father of science fiction. And uh, uh, reading this novel, uh, we could uh, agree that uh, uh, he is, he was the uh, uh, father of uh, science fiction, certainly. And uh, uh, in view of the fact that uh, the book was uh, written, the novel was written about uh, 100 years ago, uh, it is surprising to find a lot of information, a lot of uh, uh, what is being described in this book is uh, 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 what, what we have uh, discovered so far. And uh, uh, besides, a, as a literary work, I think it's, it's great. Uh, uh, this afternoon, we are going to uh, uh, go through uh, uh, chapters from uh, chapter chapter 16 to the end of chapter, chapter uh, uh, 26. And uh, I think uh, what is interesting in this structure is uh, the last uh, five chapters. Uh, from chapter 22 to 26, uh, this structure is... Uh, uh, this structure is very similar to uh, other uh, writers' uh, novel structure. For example, uh, T.H. Lawrence's uh, uh, story uh, novel uh, ends with uh, uh, the letter form and, and also um, this one ends with the, with the uh, message it uh, sent from from the moon uh, the message uh, uh, according to the uh, chapters the messages uh, 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 were uh, being sent by mr. cable the uh, scientist who uh, uh, left behind in the moon and uh, 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 in this in this structure, probably H.G. Uh, uh, Wells wanted to say a lot of things about moon, and uh, so these last five chapters uh, uh, are very important uh, because uh, uh, because of the last five chapters, uh, this novel seems to be uh, more. Uh, meaningful to the readers. And uh, at the time, I think, uh, in its own time, uh, this novel must be a uh, sensation because uh, a lot of interesting facts uh, are uh, a, lot of the, a lot of things imagined were recorded in the book. Uh, uh, let's go to the chapters themselves. Uh, chapter 16 is a uh, uh, th this uh, has a title, Points of View, and uh, uh, in, in this chapter, uh, uh, Mr. Bedford and uh, Mr. Cable fight with the moon people. And for example, on uh, page 90, uh, the description of the uh, fighting is very interesting because uh, uh, it reveals uh, the fact that uh, uh, English people or people from from the Earth are superior, superior uh, to the Moon people. And uh, let's go to page ninety. Page ninety, second paragraph from top. My milled army. Mailed, mailed hands seem to go clean through him. He smelled like, smashed like, uh, like some softy sort of sweet 
with liquid in it. He broke right in. He squelched and splashed. It was like hitting a damp toadstool. The flimsy body went spinning a dozen yards, fell with a flabby impact. I was astonished. I was incredulous that any living thing could be so flimsy. For an instant, I could have believed the whole thing a dream. It's quite interesting because uh, uh, the two people uh, from, from, the, from the Earth uh, are described as very powerful uh, people. Right? Uh, they have a superpower, super, right? And uh, compared with them, the uh, people uh, in the moon are very, something like very, uh, very uh, weak persons like this, right? So, uh, and uh, uh, on page uh, 101, One hundred one. Uh, 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 let's go to page uh, ninety-three. Okay, ninety-three. Uh, description of the moon people. Ninety-three. Is the. Um, uh, as in uh, Edgar Allan Poe's uh, story, uh, uh, the pit and pendulum, the, the sound uh, is very, uh, the writers focus on uh, depicting the sound in this novel and also in uh, Edgar Allan Poe's novel. And uh, for example, uh, they are uh, running away uh, from, from, from the uh, moon people and uh, they are still in the, in the cave underground. Uh, uh, and uh, this is the description. As I stared up, drip, came a drop of water upon my face. I started and stood aside, drip, fell another, another drop quite audibly on the rocky floor. Uh, is uh, also in other places on page uh, 101. Uh, there is the, this is in chapter 17, the fight in the cave of the moon butchers. Uh, here is the description. Indisputably, uh, there were several selenites, perhaps a considerable number, in this space. For we could hear the noises of their intercourse faint sound that I in identified as their footfalls. There was also a succession of regularly repeated sounds, chit, 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 which began and seized, suggestive of a knife or a spade, hacking at some soft su substance. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the description of the butchers cutting the moon calves, moon calves, right? And uh, in fact, uh, uh, in the moon, there are different sorts of uh, selenites. Uh, there are many different sorts of selenites, uh, but uh, it is of one species, uh, like, in, like in Earth, on Earth, right? Uh, on page 108, also there is a uh, fighting scene is, is a massacre, okay? Uh, page one, 108. Let's go to page 108. Second paragraph. For a minute, perhaps, it was a massacre. It was massacre. I was too fierce to disc discriminate, and the Selenites were probably too scared to fight. At any rate, they made no sort of fight against me because uh, uh, bad food is too strong for them, right? Uh, I saw Scarlet, as the saying is, I remember, I seemed to be wading through those leathery thin things 
as a man wades through tall grass, mowing and hitting a first right, then left smash. Uh, little drops of moisture flew about. I trod on things that crushed and piped and went slippery. The crowd seemed to open and close and flow like water. They seemed to have uh, no combined plan whatever. There were spears flew about me. I was gazed upon the ear, over the ear by one. I was stabbed once in the arm and once in the cheek, but I, I, I only could, I only found, found that I found it out afterwards when the blood had the time to run and cool and feel wet. Okay. Uh, and let's go chapter 18 in the sunlight. Uh, in this chapter, I find uh, Uh, the people from the earth, the two, two people from the earth, feel that uh, they, they have an enormous, enormous confidence. Uh, here is the quote uh, uh, from page 110. The last fight had filled us with an enormous confidence in ourselves, so far as the Selenites were concerned. Uh, on page 115, Mr. Kewa worries about the secret of moon being full of gold. Uh, there is lots, lots of gold on, 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 on this, uh, in, in, in the moon. And uh, if the fact that uh, there is lots of gold in, in, in the moon, uh, people from Earth will uh, invade, uh, invade the moon, right? So uh, Mr. Kewa is worried about that. So. Mr. Cable worries about the secret of the moon being full of gold. The Earth's governments will struggle to come here and the warfare will spread in the moon. Uh, on page 114, okay. Uh, and uh, uh, page, on page 115, uh, Stratford and uh, Kavor decided for uh, the uh, spaceship uh, they, they used to uh, come to the moon. Uh, he uh, lived toward north. Uh, they decided to uh, search uh, two different places at the same time. And uh, Mr. Kavor uh, went to, to north went, and uh, uh, here is this description, how he uh, went. Uh, he seemed to drip through the air as a dead leaf would do, fell lightly and lived again. So, uh, so. and uh, in chapter 19, Mr. Bathford is alone. And uh, page 116, 116. Uh, I the rocks of the basin made it started with gold. Uh, was about gold, but uh, he was no longer as interested in it. He was no longer interested in it. He wondered why they came to the moon. Uh, wondered why they came to the moon, and he was reason. Man is not made simply to go about being safe and comfortable. And they, they uh, came here, right? He, so uh, finally, uh, Mr. Bedford uh, find the sphere. He saw the sphere when he had intent to go into the moon. He, uh, he found Kavor's hat instead of him and the little piece of paper crumpled. He summoned it out and uh, read it. He was captured by the moon people. And there is a very uh, impressive uh, description of uh, the state of his being alone. Uh, 
Bedford uh, is alone, and uh, what he felt is described as follows, page 123. 123. Uh, then indeed was I alone, over me, round me, closing in on me, embracing me ever nearer was the eternal. That which was before the beginning and that which triumphs over the end, that enormous void in which all light and life and being is but the thin and vanishing splendor of falling star, the cold, the stillness, the silence, the infinite and final night of space, the sense of solitude and desolation became the sense of an overwhelming presence that stooped towards me, that almost touched me. No, I cried, no, 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 not yet, not yet. Wait, 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 oh, wait. My voice went up to a shriek. I flung the crumpled paper from me, scrambled back to the crest to take my bearings, and then with all the will that was in me, leaped out toward the mark I had left deem and distant now in the very margin of the shadow. So it's, it's getting dark, so if it's too late, he uh, will not be able to go back to the uh, place uh, in which the sphere uh, is where he is, uh, is. So lip, 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 and each lip was seven aces. Before me, the pale serpent girdled section of the sun sank and sank. The advancing shadow swept to seize the fear before. I could reach it. I was two miles away, a hundred lips or more, and the air about me was thinning out as it thins under an air pump, and the cold was gripping at my joints. But had I died, I should have died leaping once. And then again, my foot slipped on the gathering snow as I leaped and shortened my leap. Once I fell short into bushes that crashed and smashed into dusty chips and nothingness. And once I stumbled, stumbled as I dropped and rolled, head over heels into a golden gully, and rose bruised and brooding and confused as to my direction. But my instincts were as nothing to the intervals, those awful poses when one drifted through the air towards that pouring tide of night. My breathing made a piping noise and it was as though knives were falling in my lungs. My heart seemed to beat against the top of my brain. Shall I reach it? Oh, heaven, shall I reach it? My whole being became anguish. Lie down, screamed the pain and despair, lie down. So there's temptation to lie down and die, but uh, his will to reach it, his will to survive is stronger than the uh, the, 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 the uh, desire to lie down, right? The nearer I struggled, the more awfully remote it seemed. I was numb. I stumbled and bruised. I, I uh, bruised and cut myself, did not bleed. It was inside. Finally, the sphere was in. I fell on all fours and my lungs whooped. I crawled. The first, the frost gathered on my lips. Icicles hung from my mustache. I was white with the freezing atmosphere. I was a dozen yards from it. My eyes had become dim. Lie down, scream, disappear. Lie down. I touched and hold it too late. Scream, despair. Lie down. I fought stiffly with it. I was on the manhole lip, stupefied, half being dead, half, half dead, half dead being. The snow was all about me. I pulled myself in. They're locked within a little warm, warmer air. The snowflakes, the flakes, about me as I tried with chilling hands to thrust the valve in and spun it tight and hard. I sobbed, I will. I chattered in, uh, in my teeth and then with fingers that quivered and felt brittle, I turned to the shutters. As I fumbled with the switches, for I had never controlled them before, I could only dimly uh, through the steaming glass, the blazing red streamers of the sinking sun dancing and flickering through the snowstorm. 
and the black forms of the scrub thickening and bending and breaking beneath the accumulating snow. Thicker world, the snow and thicker black against light. What if even now the switches overcame me? Then something clicked under my hands, and in an instant, that last vision of the moon world was hidden from my eyes. I was in the silence and darkness of the interplanetary sphere. Finally, he is in, in the uh, interplanetary sphere. Um, um, uh, in the silence and darkness of the interplanetary sphere. Right? Okay, chapter 20. Uh, Mr. Bedford is in infinite, infinite space. Uh, page 129. Okay. Uh, Mr. Bedford is in uh, in a state of this for a time I struggled against this really against this really very grotesque delusion. I tried to summon the memory of vivid moments of tender or intense emotion to my assistance. I felt that if I could recall one genuine twinge of feeling, the growing severance would be stopped, but I could not do it. I saw Bedford rushing down Chancery Lane, hat on the back of his head, coat tails flying out, on load for his public examination. I saw him dowsing, bumping against, and even saluting other similar little creatures in this swarming gutter of people, me. I saw Bedford the same evening in the sitting room of a certain lady who was on the table beside him, and it, uh, it wanted brushing badly. Me, I saw him with, the lady, with that lady in various attitudes and emotions. I never felt so detached before. I saw him hurrying off to Limpney to write a play, a costume a cable, and in his uh, shirt sleeves working at the sphere, working out the Canterbury because he was afraid to come. Me, I did not believe it. Okay, and uh, uh, return to Earth. Uh, 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 back to page uh, 31, second paragraph. Hit the water with huge splash. It must have sent it a fathom high. At the splash, I flung the cavalry's shutters open. Down I went, but slower and slower, and then I felt the sphere pressing against my feet, and so drove up against the bubble the drives. The last, I was floating and rocked on the surface of the sea, and my journey. Page, page. Um, uh, chapter, chapter 22 to the last chapter, chapter 26. As I said, it's, it's an interesting chapter. Uh, these chapters are the uh, recordings of the message uh, from uh, Mr. Cable from the moon, in the moon, right? So. Uh, Chapter 22, uh, uh, 21. Uh, as I said, uh, the uh, two other novels, Mary Charles Frankenstein and D. H. Lawrence Lady Chatterton, both novels uh, uh, are, are closing with. Uh, uh, letters uh, uh, like this, like this novel, and uh, uh, the letter form is very effective uh, to uh, 
uh, give us a lot of information and, uh, for, in order to conclude the novel, uh, uh, this poem must be a very effective, a very useful for, 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 for the writers, right? Mm. Okay, chapter 22, uh, the title is uh, Astonishing Communication of Mr. Julius Wandiji. Uh, page 142 uh, 42, okay to 43 Bedford has for the Mount Rosa to get the passages from uh, and uh, chapter 23 uh, uh, it's, it's an abstract from the six messages first received from Mr. Kevar. Bethel dislikes Kevar's description of him. It is unfair to him. He desires to steal the mark upon me. <laughs> it's very interesting because uh, uh, Mr. Kevar must have thought that uh, Bethel is dead now and uh, uh, maybe uh, Kevar uh, wants to steal a mark upon Bedford. So uh, this part seems to be interesting because uh, uh, to this kind of thing, this kind of uh, thing is quite uh, uh, natural, quite, uh, quite human, right? So uh, I think it seems to be interesting to me, okay. Chapter 24. The natural history of the Selenites. Uh, there are uh, a lot of a lot of uh, interesting uh, observations or interesting uh, 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 things imagined by by H.G. Wells, and uh, and much of it is very surprising to us. Right? Uh, on page uh, one one hundred fifty two, there is a quote. There are a number of other sorts of selenite, and yet not different species of creatures, but only different forms of one species, like uh, human beings, right? And uh, uh, Fihu and Chupo, Chupo uh, uh, Kaver translators, ch translators uh, Fihu, he uh, learns English from him and uh, translates for Kevor, uh, for example, page on page 158, 158. Okay, uh, uh, on page 150, 158, second paragraph. Uh, here, here is how uh, Fihu translates. Okay, uh, third paragraph. Hmm, he, if I may say, draw, eat little, drink little, draw, love draw, not a thing, hate all who draw like him, angry, hate all who draw like him better, hate most people, hate all who not think, all the, all the world for to draw, angry, hmm, all things mean nothing to him, only draw, I like you, he like, he like you, and uh, if you understand, new thing to draw, ugly, striking. Uh, <laughs> so it seems, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's imperfect, but still, uh, uh, it, it carries some meaning, right? Uh, in chapter 24, there is a uh, introduction of the, uh, the master of the moon, the rule of the moon, and, and his name is, uh, uh, he is called the Grand Runa, the Grand Runa. Okay, let's go to page 160, uh, Here is a description of the, uh, the master of the moon. And uh, certainly he is one, one uh, selenate, but he is different. And he is a highly intellectual and uh, uh, his, uh, the description is very, very interesting, okay? Uh, on page 160, second paragraph. 
These beings with big hairs on whom the intellectual laborers fall, form of sort, uh, form a sort of aristocracy in this strange society. And at the head of them, quintessential of the moon, is that marvelous, gigantic ganglion, the Grand Luna, into whose presence I'm finally to come. The unlimited development of the minds of the intellectual class is rendered possible by the absence of any other bony skull in the lunar anatomy. It's interesting, right? The unlimited development of the minds, right? The strange box of bone that clamps about the developing uh, brain of man, imperiously insist insisting thus far and no farther to all his possibilities. They fall into three main classes of differing greatly in inference and respect. There are administrators of whom Fi Wu, Fi Wu is one, Selenist of considerable initiative and versatility, responsible for uh, responsible each for a certain cubic content of the moon's bulk. The experts like the football headed thinker who are trained to perform certain special operations and the erudite who are the repositories of all knowledge. To the latter class it belongs Chu Pop, the first lunar professor of ter uh, terrestrial languages. With regard to these, matter, these latter, it is a curious thing, curious little thing to note that the unlimited growth of the lunar brain has rendered unnecessary the invention of all those mechanical aids to brain work which have distinguished uh, the career of man. Uh, there are no books, no records of any sort, no libraries or inscriptions. <coughs> all knowledge is stored in the standard brain, much as the high ants of Texas store honey in the distended abdomens. abdomens. The Luna Somerset House and the Luna British Museum Library are collections of living brains. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, part, right? No libraries, right? All the knowledge is stored in the brain, in distended brains. Uh, 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 chapter 25 is a, uh, uh, is a chapter on the master of the moon and the so-called Grand Luna. Uh, he is uh, described as follows, page 168. Second paragraph on page 168. He was seated in what was uh, a blaze of incandescent blue. This and the darkness about him gave him an effect of floating in a blue-black void. He seemed a small, self-luminous cloud at first, brooding on his somber throne. His brain, brain is must have measured many yards in diameter. For some reason that I cannot fathom, a number of blue search lights radiated from behind the throne on what he set, and immediately encircling him was a halo. About him a little and indistinct in this glow, a number of body servants sustained and supported him, and overshadowed, standing in a huge semi-circle beneath him was, were his intellectual subordinates. His remembrances and comp computators and researchers and servants, all the distinguished insects of the court of the moon, still lower stood ushers and messengers, and then all down the countless steps of the throne were guards, and at the base, enormous various indistinct, vanishing at last into an absolute black, a vast swaying multitude of the minor dignitaries of the moon. Their feet made a perpetual scraping whisper on the rocky floor as the limbs move with a rustling murmur. As I entered the uh, penultimate hall, the music rose and expanded into an imperial magnificence of sound and the shriek of the new bearers died away. Very interesting. Right? 
okay. Uh, final chapter. Chapter 26. Uh, uh, it seems that cable is put to death uh, because uh, because uh, uh, the Earth's ugly secrets have been revealed in spite of himself. Uh, such things as war, irrational violence, insatiable aggressions, conflicts, and things like that. Probably because of uh, these things, uh, uh, he seems to be uh, put to death. Uh, Mr. Cable explains uh, uh, what, the, what, what kind of things are uh, taking place on Earth. Uh, for example, page 177, chapter 26, second paragraph. On this unsatisfactory manner, the penultimate message of Cable dies out. One seems to see him, see him away there in the blue obscurity but meshed this apparatus intensely signaling us to the last, all unaware, uh, un, unaware of the certain, the curtain of confusion that dropped between us, all un, unaware, too, of the final dangers that even then must have been creeping upon him. His disastrous one of vulgar common sense, he lacks common sense, and he reveals uh, these facts. This disastrous want of common sense had utterly betrayed him. He had talked of war, he had talked of all the strength and irrational violence of man, of their insatiable aggressions, their tunnel's futility of comfort. He had filled the whole moon world with this impression of our race, and then I think it is plain that he made the most fatal admission that upon himself alone hung the possibility at least for a long time, of any further man reaching the moon. The line, the cold in human region of the moon, would take, seems plain enough to me, and suspicion of it, and then perhaps some sudden sharp realization of it, must have come to him, must have come to him. One imagine, imagines him about the moon with the remorse of this fatal indiscretion growing in his mind. During a certain time, I'm inclined to guess the Grand Luna was deliberating the new situation, and for all that time, Cable must have gone as free as ever he had gone. But obstacles of some sort prevented his getting to his electromagnetic apparatus again after that message I have just given. For some days we received nothing. Perhaps he was having fresh audiences, but trying to evade his previous admissions. Who could hope to guess? And then suddenly, like a cry in the night, like a cry that is followed by a stillness, came the last message. It is the briefest fragments, broken beginnings of two sentences. The first was, I was mad to let the Grand Luna know of all these uh, facts. There was an interval of perhaps uh, a minute. One imagined some interruption from without, departure from the instrument, a dreadful hesitation among the looming masses of apparatus in that dim, blue-lit cavern, a sudden rush back to it, full of a resolve that came too late. Then, as if it were hastily transmitted, came, k Rod made as follows, take, there followed one word, a quite unmeaning word, as it stands, use all this. And that is all. It may be he made a hasty attempt to spell useless when his fate was close on him. Whatever it was that was happening about uh, uh, that apparatus, was, we cannot tell. And uh, the final uh, part is like this. Whatever it was, we shall never know. We shall never, I know, receive another message from the moon. For my own part, a vivid dream has come to my help. I see almost as plainly as, as I'd seen it in actual fact, a blue lit shadowy disheveled cable, struggling in the grip of these insect selenites, struggling ever more desperately and hopelessly as they pressed on him, shouting 
expostulating, perhaps even at last fighting, and being forced backwards step by step, out of all speech and sign of his fellows, forevermore into the unknown, into the dark, into the silence that has no end. So it's evident that uh, he must have died. Okay, finally, uh, we are finished uh, this uh, story and uh, a little uh, a bit about uh, the final exam. Well, uh, uh, in the f final exam, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, make a question, uh, uh, making use of uh, uh, three, three different uh, uh, books. One is uh, Edgar Allan Poe's Pit and Pendulum, and another is uh, Aldous Huxley's The Brave New World, and finally, H.G. Wells' uh, The First Man of the Moon. And uh, also, uh, one question will be uh, 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 about the, uh, uh, the subject of uh, uh, the man in bottle, in the bottle. Uh, Lady Chatler's Lover uh, by D.H. Lawrence has also that theme. Uh, uh, Clifford is uh, wheelchair bound, and uh, wheelchair is uh, kind of bottle, right? And uh, also uh, in Huxley's Brave New World, uh, the hatchery is a very important. Uh, uh, concept in, in, in the world state and all human beings were born uh, out of bottles, right? And uh, also H.G. Uh, Wells' uh, sh story, The First Man in the Moon, there was also a concept of uh, uh, man in a bottle and uh, uh, like in uh, Brave New World, uh, moon people uh, have been uh, uh, made uh, uh, the types of uh, moon people are determined by uh, the means, right? Where uh, the people, the people will work, right? For example, uh, if they work in a, a factory uh, dealing with uh, small machines, then uh, that kind of people, that, that kind of uh, selenite is kind of very small people and things like that. They, they have uh, very uh, uh, delicate tentacles, hands, uh, instead of big brains, right? And, uh, uh, the intellectual people have uh, huge brains, uh, like the uh, master of the moon. And I think H.C. Uh, Wells' uh, novel is quite uh, fascinating. And uh, uh, though it was written in uh, about uh, 100 years ago, uh, uh, all the uh, uh, fact or, or all the uh, things described in it are surprisingly uh, uh, those things uh, we, we came to know later on. And uh, uh, certainly uh, he, he, uh, he deserves being called 
the father of science fiction. Okay, so much for today. Thank you.